Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us here on the Players Lounge podcast. We're going to be joined by the world number one T20 batsman. But first up, we're joined by uh, Graham Swan. Swan, it's great to see you. Uh, you're back in a hotel room doing a quarantine. Uh, a little bit of difficult times at the moment. Yeah, obviously the, the IPL being uh, suspended, which has been a big shame, but I think the right call um, with everything going on in India. India's down on its knees at the minute and needs to get back. It's a great country and it will, but... With the IPL being suspended, there was a sudden scramble for flights. Mm. I delighted in all the Australians not being able to go straight back home <laughs> because it was funny from my point of view. Um, Aren't they in the Maldives? No, funny. Yes, they went to the Maldives yeah. um, and got a free holiday. But Aussies being Aussies still moaned about it. It's all fun. Um, but yeah, look, I mean, luckily, um, I was able to fly home. And so I'm sat in a mm. hotel room in Birmingham, just outside Birmingham Airport. Doing another 10 days of quarantine. Can't wait to see my family who are just down the road. Yeah. Um, and it's just about a week away. So, yes, but I'm good. How are you? Yeah, uh, well, good. Uh, me personally, good. But as you mentioned, you know, times are tough. It is really devastating to see what's going on back home. And of course, you, you, although you were in the bubble, it's you're not oblivious to what people are going through at the moment. And uh, the thing is, though, Swani, to see citizens just coming together, galvanizing into action to help others are happening things so far. So, you know, everyone is just trying to do a little bit of what they can. And, um, you know, that's the spirit that I hope will continue in uh, what have been you know, really the darkest times. And, and I'm sure you felt it. I mean, you have a lot of great love for India. Indian people love you. So I'm sure it has been emotional uh, seeing it from the outside as well. Yeah, it was. And it was hard from my, our point of view as well, working from a broadcasting point of view on the IPL. Um, we were getting a lot of messages of support. People saying, look, this is uh, sort of, this is keeping us going. It's something to look forward to. It's something to keep us indoors and actually help with the social distancing and stuff like that and, and staying safe. Um, so from that point of view, we, we, could, we could say that we were doing a good thing by broadcasting. But I think it was inevitable once the virus got inside one of the bubbles the, the tournament was obviously untenable. So it's a real shame that it did. I think it's the right thing at the moment. And absolutely, I think the IPL won't yeah. move quickly and decisively once they realise that it was uh, mm -hmm. untenable. So may India get back on its feet as soon as possible because, like you say, I love the place yeah. and I love the people. You know, thanks so much for those words, Swani. It really does mean a lot for all of us at home in India who are you know, going through this in various capacities. Uh, really excited, as you said, sometimes to just take your mind off things to have these sort of chats. And we're going to be joined by, you know, David Milan, who just got his first, literal first taste of uh, the IPL. How excited were you to see, you know, another English player, South African heritage, not South African heritage, we'll get into that Look, later, but another English, yeah. English player make his way in this global league. I was over the moon. Um, you know, it's, it's natural for players to feel real affinity towards uh, people from their own country. So I, re I was really cheering for every English player out there and see David get the game um, and only get one game before the IPL suspended. But we'll talk about that with him. He's a great bloke. I, I can tell you this now. He's one of the good guys. He's a great bloke. And he is English. All right. He is English. <laughs> Beautifully said. So let's get straight into it. Uh, let's get a chance to spoil, uh, speak to David right now. Uh, let's put pressure on David straight away because, you know, we, we just like to have so much fun with things like that. What are you expecting uh, from David in this interview? Well, am I, well I, I'll tell you what I do know is that David is the funniest, the most intelligent <laughs> and the most handsome player to play for England in the last 20 years. So I, I'm expecting him to absolutely dazzle us, to be honest. Definitely number no pressure, three. David. No, definitely number three. I'm not sure about the first two. <laughs> Now, David, thank you so much, actually, for uh, taking out the time to be with us. Uh, I apologize for this question in advance, but how many times have you been called David in your life? David, uh, funny enough, I, I've actually just joined a bat company and uh, at the bottom of the bat, they, they wrote my name, but they spell it D-E-V-I-D. -E so it's David Milan. And then on the sticker that's supposed to be David Milan, they put David Milan. So it just shows you how many people get it wrong, literally from uh, from week to week. Um, but yeah, look, I, I've, it's, it's David, it's... David, it's like there's so many variations of it, but you know, all sounds the same. It all works. It all gets my attention. So, I just spent two months in the commentary box trying to convince the Indian commentators that it was Dawid and not David. <laughs> well, so it's not, da it's, it's not Dawid. When I'd read it out. I'd say, "Look, it's Dawid." They go, "David." 
I go, no, 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 come on. <laughs> Sonny, it's David. David. And then just fast through in the end, I just went, yeah, you know what, it's Dave. Dave to his mates. Uh, you know, tell, tell us the story now. So you're born in London suburbs, moved to South Africa, play for England now. Um, so the way the story goes, my, my dad obviously uh, is South African. He came over uh, as a dentist uh, back in the day, met my mom, obviously had myself, my brother and my uh, and my sister. And then as the story goes, my dad picked me up from school one day and saw me walking with my shoelaces undone, socks down, shirt untucked, um, looking scruffy as hell um, and decided that's not how he wanted us to get brought up. So he uh, quit his job and flew us straight over to South Africa and put us into a school where there's a bit of discipline. Not that I had much choice. Um, and then when I finished with, sc- when I was finished with school, um, I came over to do a gap year. Um, I coached at Arundel School. Well, I actually stayed with your mate, Swanee, with, uh, with um, what's his name? Um, Ajaz Cameron, Akhtar. C- Cameron Wake. Yeah, well, I played with Ajaz Akhtar. Um, I think he claimed I was the worst overseas player they've ever had, which is fair, fair enough. I didn't score a run for Sounds him. like Ajaz. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, played, I, I stayed with John Wake for a bit um, up in Andal. He was the master of cricket at, at, at Andal School. Um, you know, so, um, and then I just did a few trials for the MCC Young Cricketers. Scored some runs. Clive Radley gave me a, a contract, and then um, Middlesex came knocking. And you know, I was at Middlesex for what twelve, thirteen years before moving wow. to Yorkshire, and then things obviously worked out from there. I tell you, it's a brilliant story. But one thing that's a bit strange about it is that normally in England we only take people who were born in South Africa and let them play for our country. <laughs> the fact you're born in England really throws a, a spanner in the works. So I don't know what to make of this. I think they realised that too late. I think they thought I was born <laughs> in South Africa. <laughs> <laughs> Well, he's actually English. Probably English. Oh, dear God. What are we going to do about this? I know, with David Johannes Milan, as English as they come. <laughs> I read this somewhere that you really kind of got into cricket watching the 2005 Ashes. Is that right? I mean, what was like the turning point for you where you realised this is the game that you want to play seriously? No, I wouldn't say that the 2005 was what really wanted me to play cricket. It's what actually properly captivated me from international mm. cricket around the world because when you grow up in South Africa you pretty much only know about mm. South African cricket um that's all you sort of watch that's all you sort of you know everyone talks about their own countries a lot as they do in, in, in every country so you're not really um sort of shown different countries around the world and how how people go about playing um you know so that 2005 ashes I remember coming home from it would be training and you'd catch the last couple of hours on 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 um super sport i think it was at the time it might still be uh, they'd show that there and then and that was always the the biggest point of the games was the last two hours of the or the last sort of session of the game mm-hmm. so that sort of um got me really really interested in the sense of um you know what was going on around the world obviously as a i, I probably decided when i was about 15 that i'd love to give, give cricket a go um you know where I was at a, a rugby school um in South Africa so the the cricket wasn't that good so when you're half decent you're so much better than the rest you actually start to believe that you're a decent cricketer when you're 15 years old so um that was sort of the the thing that sort of made me want to play cricket more so yeah but it's no, uh, I it's, can't think of it I can't think of anything for if you're a handsome man and you're playing in the pack in South African school rugby <laughs> you're going to end up very very ugly by the end of it so well done you I know there's some big boys out there. I was actually um, there was a a kid. So when I was uh, eighteen, and you're a prefect and what have you, you're sort of uh, able to discipline some of the kids if they're if if they're naughty at school. That was sort of um, the tradition at the time. And I, I remember, sort of about four years after I finished school, I was in steers as you do, ordering a chicken burger um, and some fries, um, and I got a tap on the shoulder from this this kid. Um, wearing the the school uniform and he was absolutely huge um and he tapped me on the shoulder and said you know who I am and I was like no and he was like you're Darth Milan and I was like yeah I am and he was like you used to hit me at school and I was like no I didn't and when I t- and, and honestly he, he played SA schools that year um weighed 120 kilograms for a school kid that's how big they are in South Africa which is hey, um, but why why, you know, why just... would you pick on a, a young lad at school I mean this is what's wrong with the South African system <laughs> all this discipline and socks pulled up and getting caned I'd rather yours shoelaces untied socks around your ankles sauntering down the road with your hands in your pockets any day for me <laughs> well you know it just teaches you the right way of living Swanee doesn't it it just absolutely. just gets you down the line. absolutely but was it uh, look you made your T20 debut against South Africa were there some sort of 
mixed emotions when obviously you know you're making a debut an international debut it's a huge moment in uh, your personal uh, you know milestones in your lifetime and then it's again south africa any sort of mixed emotions there yeah a little bit um you know as a, as a kid growing up you know i'd be lying if i was going to say I, i wanted to play cricket for england you know i, I grew up in south africa all my schooling and, and age group and all my idols were South Africans. So, um, you know, to, to be able to make your debut for England against the country that you always wanted to play for as a kid when you were growing up, as, as I said, that's all you really know when you're sort of seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and you're sort of supporting a team that your father supports. That's what you sort of look at, um, you know, sort of play against them and to play against, you know, A.B. de Villiers was playing in that game, who was one of my heroes growing up as a, as a kid. And suddenly, you're, you know, you wanted to play with him for South Africa. And then suddenly you're uh, you're playing against him, even though it was ten years uh, ten years later. But you know it was a surreal experience. My my father was there as well. They flew over to come and watch the game. Um, so I think he had mixed emotions. I think he wanted me to score runs, but South Africa to win at the time. But I think he's changed his allegiances at the moment. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, I, you know, looking back at it, it's it was sort of something that you wouldn't have been able to 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 write as a kid that you'd um, grow up in South Africa and end up playing international cricket against that country. Um, so, you know, it was a dream come true. And it went pretty well, to be fair, that debut. Yeah, it, it actually got me a few test test knocks as well uh, out of that innings. <laughs> I think uh, Trevor Bayliss watched that and sort of said, well, why have we not looked at this bloke before? This is what um, Paul Farbrace told me. It was like he goes forward when it's full and he goes back when it's short. <laughs> and I was like, it can't be that simple TV, but... Uh, you know that was um that, that that was sort of his his philosophy was just so simple but um yeah look it went it went really well um you know so i i made a conscious effort to make sure that when i took that or well, when i had that chance i was going to make sure i took that chance and and you know you can't sort of plan to score runs but you know the way that i went out and played um was to go and show that i can play in this england white ball era um and play the way that they want they want you to play. Um, mm. You know, thankfully it came off. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be speaking to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> it was, but I remember that I was commentating on that game. And I remember just you coming in. And of course, I knew you from years of county cricket. And you know when a player comes in and there's general sort of befuddlement from the, especially the opposing commentators and people around the box and people are asking you saying is he any good is he any good yeah, I'm so glad you did because I backed you up I said this boy can bat seriously just watch this he'll be fine but even then I'm thinking come on mate don't let me down I'll just put my name on this and you did I, I don't think I've ever been more chuffed at someone's debut as I was at yours because I'd bigged you up massively and then when you when you bat like that I just walked out going well look I know I should be a selector I know I should but we're, we're letting Ed Smith and James Taylor do it the clowns so once they're finished, I'll have a go. You know, looking looking back at it, you know, I, I never really get talked about in, in, in county cricket. Um, you know, I don't reverse sweep seamers and I don't make the, the sort of highlight packages on, on social media and stuff like that, as, which is the sort of things that catch people's attention. But, um, you know, when you actually look at, at, at runs and numbers in county cricket, people are still sort of amazed. And I'm not trying to, trying to big myself up, but it was more just because of that debut, the fact that... Yeah. A lot of people were sort of saying, "How, how, where's this guy come from, and and what have you?" But I, you know, I'd actually scored quite a lot of runs in county cricket in 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 twenty twenty cricket, and even fifty over cricket. You know, fifty over cricket yeah. is probably my strongest my strongest format. Um, and considering I've played more Test cricket than than ODIs, sort of baffles me a little <laughs> bit because I, uh, I definitely wouldn't say Test cricket would be my strongest or one of my strongest. Um, you know, so but it's much better know, to be that way around to be to have people look at the records and go, "Hang on." Jesus, look how good he is. How have we missed that? Then the other way around. Then, like, yeah. oh, God, this bloke can play. And then look at his figures and just gently push them under the backboard. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, actually. We've just given someone 40 tests and he averages six. <laughs> but well, it's better pretty to be much your right. way around. Yeah, um, yeah, and it drives me more. It drives me more to keep proving a point, to keep proving people yeah. uh, people wrong. Um, you know, even now when when you play, you you have one bad game, and suddenly people are saying, "Why is this guy in the team?" Well, you're in the team because you perform for a period of time. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so it, it it does it does get a bit frustrating, but that's you know the nature of the game. At the end of the day, if you score runs, that's all that matters. But it's so interesting to hear you speak like that, and you know, speak from the heart because you are right now the number one batsman T Twenty cricket, and you also say, I mean, what are the expectations? Because as you mentioned, you can't always walk out there and score, you know, a 40 ball 100. But you know, there's immense pressure maintaining that if you're still trying to think that I need to prove people wrong. Yeah, um, well, I think that the, the, we're, we're all a, 
a sort of product of our own um, performances. You know, when you've had some good consistent performances, people expect that all the time. And that's the beauty of what comes with, with sport. You know, if you've, if you start badly and then do well for a little bit, people sort of get onto your sort of trends. But if you perform consistently for a period of time, people sort of start expecting that. Um, you know, 2020 cricket is, is a game where you fail a lot more than you succeed. There's, you know, there's there's a lot of things that can go wrong in a T20 game. I mean, you can face 10 balls and hit 10 of the best shots you've ever hit straight to cover or straight to mid-wicket or straight to mid-off. And you can be naught of 10, but you've actually not done um, anything different to what you did the the, the game before. Um, you know, so when, when, when you sort of suddenly have that pressure, you're number one, you have to score. You And, and I think the one thing with, with this England team um, that we're playing in is there's such a, a lot of good players that aren't playing as well that are in the backup that it sort of seems that as soon as you don't score runs once or twice, there's suddenly someone else needs to come in and something needs to change and something needs to be like this. Um, and, I, and it's not just for me, this is just for, for everyone that's, that's part of the team. It sort of feels like there's always, you know, as soon as you lose a game, there's suddenly, oh, we should pick this option and someone else should come in and someone this should do. This is all from the outside, obviously, and not from the inside. Yeah. The inside uh, of, of the team is totally different. The way Morgs and, Chris Silver would protect us from from the outside and 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 make us know where we stand. Um, sort of makes life a lot easier. Um, you know, from their management skills and and their personal skills and how they treat us. Um, but yeah, the 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 pressure is always going to be there. I think no matter who you are, what you've done. Um, you know, it's just about trying to close off those things from the outside, stick into what you do. Um, and if that's not good enough, then that's unfortunately not good enough for the team. I think a good thing, actually, I'm glad you said that about Morgie and Silvers looking after you from the inside the group. Because one of the things I found amazing when I left sort of the sanctity of the England dressing room, the safety of the England dressing room, was just how much bullshit is spoken on the outside. And, I mean, I love most of the guys who work in the press. There's a couple of dickheads there are in any team. <laughs> but for the most part, they really know their cricket. And, and even some of them, sometimes they'll look at you and they'll say things that you know from the team's perspective, just have no patience, they're knee-jerk reactions, like demanding this, demanding that. And it's amazing when you're in the team, honestly, just cherish it and look after that. Because Morgie, one of the reasons I think he's the best captain in world cricket by miles is the fact that he came in in 2015 and said, we're going to play this ultra-aggressive approach where you will be back to the hilt by me and you won't be dropped. It's not in one game and I'll listen to the noise in the press room and then you're out. So I think that that, that is for me why Morgan's is so good. That's why players like you can come in and have that freedom to actually play and score the runs and perform like you have. Because honestly, if the press are in charge, exactly like you say, one bad game, two bad games as a team and it's scapegoat time. So I'm so glad that it's still that strong from inside. I knew Spoons would be like that, Chris Silverwood. Because he's just as solid and down to earth as they come, but Morgie is an unsung hero of epic proportions for me. For that reason, yeah, he is. And and I think the thing that you know the you know I don't really want to talk out too much, but the the press that I don't understand is when when you start a series, Morgs will tell you that you're going to play the first two games of the five match series, or you're going to play all five. So no matter what happens, even if you get three noughts in a row, you're still going to be yeah. playing the last two. And and he gives you that peace of mind to be able to go out and play that way that he wants you to play. So you don't walk out thinking today's going to be my last innings, today's going to be my last knock, and then you sort of yeah. st- go into your shell or, or, or suddenly play a different way to what you want. So, you know, it, it does make me laugh when you sort of listen to the commentators before a game saying they should do this, maybe this is going to be, this is going to be, whereas Morgs, Morgs already decided what the team is going to be and what his yeah. batting lineup is going to be before. Obviously that changes depending on if someone has a real stinker or or, yeah. or conditions and what have you like that. But, um, you know, just, just the way they are, they are able to put you at ease and to make you feel like you are 100% part of that team is the reason that this England white ball team, I've not been part of that 50 over, over cricket, but it's exactly the same both ways through and on how successful they've been because of all that. Um, you know, and but all I can comment on is, is you know, I, I played 20 odd games for England or 25 games, whatever it is in, in 2020 cricket in that time, you know, it's been um, uh, Bairstow needs to bat three, then suddenly Banton needs to bat three, then Stokes, then it's uh, Hales, uh, then it's someone else. Um, I, I've forgotten someone else. Then it'll be the next one again. So, you know, in 24 games you, you perform, but there's still suddenly six guys that should be batting there instead of you. It's it, it's amazing yeah. how how it sort of um, it's it sort of works. Um, 
but but thankfully, you know, the way morgues and spoons, as I said, the way they sort of uh, protect you from that and reassure you that you're the man at the time, you know, that doesn't mean that you're going to play the next series. That doesn't mean I'm going to play, get picked for this next yeah. series against, against Sri Lanka, but it just means that at that moment, you're the man that they're backing and that's the, the confidence that you need. But that, that allows you to perform and then you, therefore you are going to be the next player. I mean, you've had the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You've had 24 games, you've got a thousand runs, for goodness sake. So I, I think it's brilliant. I'll take my hat off to you, A, for scoring those runs and performing when you've been given the chance. But more importantly, I think the amount of players who missed out over the years because they didn't have that backing, didn't have that same sort of security and knowledge that, you know, this isn't the last day of my life if, if it goes wrong. There is, a, there is a, another knock tomorrow. Just think. Just think what we could have been. We could have been world <laughs> champions 20 years ago. <laughs> I just want to add to what Swan is saying because you've played so much franchise cricket around the globe. You know, you have there's a lot of experience. There's a knowledge of different sort of pitches, conditions. Play. Immense pressure maintaining that if you're still trying to think that I need to prove people wrong. Yeah, um, yeah, it is. Um, you know, I think the pressures and, and it's something I know. You know, people in England um, criticise players going to the IPL. They criticise playing so much. I know the county sort of. Um, don't really like their players playing too much uh, franchise cricket in the off season, so that they're fresh for for the county season and what have you. But but the the pressure that comes with being an overseas player in these franchises, so to be one of three or one of two or one of four that you're playing and knowing that you basically you're you're there to perform, and if you don't perform, there's going to be another overseas that's going to take your place. That that sort of replicates the pressure of international cricket so well. Yeah. Um. You know, you have to fit into a team straight away. You have to fit into their culture, their their, their environment. You have to be able to play the right way, score runs. Um. And then if you're not scoring runs, you're in a total different environment. How are you going to uh, sort of act as a, as a as a person? So it teaches you so many things. Um, but not only about your game, but about yourself as a, as a person as well. And it actually uh, prepares you so well for international cricket. I think, I mean, personally, I think it's brilliant that players like you can do that. And counties do, if counties grumble about it in the off season that you're playing, just get over it, lads. It's 2021. <laughs> it's not, it's 2021, not 1921, for goodness sake. Um, yeah. Here's something for you. So you played in lots of different teams, lots of different franchises around the world. How pathetically tediously boring is every team meeting you have now because I didn't <laughs> every team meeting is exactly the same just with different bullshit management speak so tell me yeah. is there one franchise or one team who do it completely differently who like you're in the room for five minutes right this is the team this is what we're going to do let's crack a beer and go to the pub tell me there's so one team who do it differently <laughs> so the only team that does it totally differently is England cricket they're the only ones who do it totally different. And I know they're not a franchise, but, yeah. uh, you know, there's no meetings about a meeting. There's never really, you know, as as batters, there's never a batting meeting. As batters, we get around each other and we chat about, chat amongst, uh, about it amongst ourselves, about different plans of how, you know, I'd go to Morgs and say, Morgs, we're playing against, I don't know, Pakistan this week. How do you face Wahab Riaz? What's your plan to me? And he goes, this is my plan. I find if I do this to him, I'm able to, to, to get more bat on the ball, which means I'm able to hit him for more boundaries for argument's sake um and i'll be like well that's not something i thought about so then when i get to the nets i can try that and be like you know what that actually works for me or that doesn't work whereas i feel a lot of times in the meeting people's uh in, in meetings when you have meetings about a meeting about a meeting um it, it just sort just of goes around <laughs> it I, goes I, around I, I in couldn't circles be, i couldn't be more jealous of you right now because i played in a meeting for meeting era when we would sit there and talk that you the biggest loads of tosh going round and round circles and everyone has their say and everyone says something just to impress the manager that doesn't actually affect anything that you do or say. Everyone says, oh my God, <laughs> Morgan, you're even better now. <laughs> this is brilliant. But yeah, if, if you could for me, just next time, whoever you're playing for, no matter what team it is, the next time you're in a team meeting and, it's, and you look at your watch and it's now 90 minutes you've been in there and you've learned nothing new about the game of cricket, anything whatsoever but all the 16 different coaches are having their say <laughs> just think of me and smile because i've been thinking of you really well so it used to be no, the bane uh, of my life honestly so I, I, and i'm with you like i get to a stage where you know you know early on when you join new franchises and new teams and you sort of get to yeah. know how things get done and how different coaches work and and, and so on yeah. um you know early on it's always exciting when you get you know you get that message on the group saying lads team meeting at two o'clock and then batters meeting at four o'clock and then 
you know, it's, it sort of becomes new. And then by the end of it, you're like, what else do we need to say? Just leave me alone. Just leave me alone. And then you sort of get the, sometimes you get the coaches as well, which is quite funny. They try and get you to interact as a, as a team yeah. because the last three batters meetings, we haven't batted well, but people are just sitting there. So in general, so no matter where, whether you yeah. play Pakistan, Bangladesh, Australia, there's always something. And then they'll be like, what do you think? And then someone will just say the the token sort of, yeah, like catchphrase that everyone says, and everyone goes, yeah, 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 yeah. I just, and then I you just go think if get... we looked, at, how about this one? I've got a few cliches that you would have heard. Thing. So the batting's <laughs> not going well. So it really is. So say you're losing four wickets in the first fifty, first uh, ten overs, and you're not scoring runs, lads. What are we going to do? I think it's important if we just look to build partnerships, um, <laughs> and that, and that it's all about the first ten balls. And obviously, we're not going to not try and hit boundaries. We still look to be positive, but just like really try and maintain and nurture that partnership. And tell me that's not been said by every batsman in the whole world. That is every batting coach, or not batting coach. That's every batting meeting down to a T. Especially if you're yeah. trying, if you're playing well, then it's like yeah, just just go on as you go along. But that's yeah, yeah it, it, that is definitely, and it's it, you know I think that's you know. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's. I, I think it's just because there's so much pressure on franchises. There's so much pressure on coaches, no matter who they are, no matter yeah. what they've done, no matter wh- whether they're coaching in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Australia, T10. There's pressure to perform and there's pressure to do the right things. And if you're ultimately, if you're not discussing things as a team, whether it be as a batter or a bowling, you know, is that seen as you know, we're not doing enough to make sure yeah. that we're prepared. Um, so you know, the so box. Co- cover, cover your bases, tick the box. Pr- pretty much. And, it's, and, so and I don't, don't want to criticize. You don't have to say that. I can say that now. I don't you, play you can, anymore, yeah, yeah. You, 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 you can say all that because it's, it's, it's hard to criticize because I've not been a coach. So I don't know what it's like yeah. when you're getting pressure from owners in whatever franchise league you're playing in or whatever league you're playing yeah. in, um, you know, when they want results and they're expecting results. So I don't, I don't know how... Um, yeah. You know how how that would feel uh, from that point of view. Um, well, I tell you, know, you what, to... they should, I tell you one thing that'd be good if if other people thought like, I mean, the biggest change in international cricket has been Owen Morgan in England and the way they've done things compared to when I played. Trust me, it's chalk and cheese, and they've gone. We've gone from being one of the worst teams in the world to the best team in the world, or you know, arguably top two. So why do other people copy that model? Honestly, because I used to sit there, in, and but, so the batters meeting is that we'll build partnerships, we'll do this, and we'll look to have wickets in hand at the end. The bowlers equivalent is, and I've sat there, and bowlers tend to think they're more salt of the earth, and you know we won't waste time. And bowling coaches, for the most part, are very good blokes who were bowlers before, and they don't want to waste time in the meetings. <laughs> but each and every one of them will say, right, the important thing is. Bowling partnerships, which means nothing. <laughs> Doesn't matter how well I, I can't affect how the bloke at the other end's bowling. But get in and out of the over. So don't go for a four or a six on your first or last ball of the over. Well, duh. You don't want to go for a four or six of any ball. <laughs> but it's a brilliant cliche. And the other one is, hey, and don't be don't be afraid to like to give away a single to save a boundary. Oh my god! Of course I'll give away a single to save a boundary. <laughs> oh, it still makes me honestly. Team meetings and warm ups. Oh my word! Finish them. I'm so glad I don't have to do them anymore. Yeah, well, just to add on to that, the good thing about it is it it actually encourages you to to speak to your teammates outside of a meeting point of view. So you actually yes end up learning. You know, I I I had wasn't hitting the ball as well in India as I'd have liked in the first. Um, well, after the first, the first game was irrelevant, but the second and the third game, and you know, walking down with with Joss uh, one of the days and he would sort of say like I'd get myself into this position I'd look to hit this area and it might be something that I, I thought of or haven't thought of um, and if it's something you haven't thought of it's something that you can then practice and put into use whereas in a batters meeting Joss would never say that you know I yeah. uh, you know p- players would sort of just say as you say they say the basic things just to get the meeting through and done but yeah. when you speak to someone on a one-on-one basis and you talk to them about their game plans but how they would play uh, I don't know if the 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 leggy is it Chahal that played um, Chahal. Sorry, is it Chahal or Chahal? I think it's Chahal. The the, the leggy that played. For him. Um, yeah. So like um, you know, you something that Stokesy would pick up, I might not pick up, and something that I pick up, Morgs might not pick up. So it, it, we're sort of encouraged to speak amongst each other quite a lot, um, and it actually feels like we grow our game quicker because we're learning yeah. from each other. Who are you know? And I'm I'm in a great position where I'm learning from the best white player, white ball players that have ever 
you know, played the game for for England um, and how yeah. they've dominated world cricket for four or five or six years. So, you know, it gives me an insight of learning from the best instead of speaking, you know, maybe listening to a meeting, which, you know, as you said, people don't really open up as much. But when I first started playing, the difference for, between when I first started and you would sit and you would talk to your teammates, to the opposition in county cricket, um, and your, your captain would tell you to go and find the spinner in the opposition and talk to him. And he might be plastered in a corner, but you'd learn the game there. I mean, that sort of one-on-one -on -one talking is way more effective. Coaches, if you're listening, is way more effective than a, coach, than a bowler's meeting or a batsman's meeting where cliches are spouted out more than politicians would. And Darren Milan said so, and he's number one in the world. <laughs> Don't quote me on that one. That's funny. No, Graham Swan <laughs> says so, and he's not number one in the world. <laughs> oh, yeah, but it, it it is a it is an interesting um, subject. So not only the meeting bit, but just the the fact that you as you as you touched on going to speak to opposition players. Um, you know, it's something that I've always tried to do. I've always personally tried to sound out like if you, when we're playing against Surrey, I try and catch uh, Kumar Sangakara, who I admire as a you know, yeah. as a fellow batter, as a left as hander, someone that, <laughs> to be so, so, someone that I bit, and it's and it's you know guys like that are so approachable as well. So even like Chris Gale playing for for Punjab Kings, you know I've played against Chris a couple of times um, in, in in the franchises. You know I've spoken to, but I've never really thought that I could speak to him about batting. I was always yeah. a bit like, gosh, this is Chris Gale. He's the best T Twenty player that's ever played the game. Like, how do yeah. I approach Chris Gale? But then when you're suddenly in a team with him and you ask him a question, the knowledge that he actually has and that he gives you and that he's willing to freely give you yeah. without sort of being scared of speaking to him, it, it, it's it's amazing how you learn from players. And, and you might not take anything from them, but you might just take that yeah. one small thing that you can add to your game that can make you, you know, score four or five runs more off the same amount of yeah. balls, whatever it may be. And that suddenly can change a game and win you a game. And, and, and that's something that... You know, I think with the COVID situation now, it's probably gone out of the game. You know, you're not allowed to mix with the opposition. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a bit interesting to see how that changes over the like, uh, next couple of years. Okay, let me go back to that while we're on that, about talking to other players. After that debut against South Africa, were you able to go and talk to A.B. de Villiers then? Was that the first time you met him? I mean, because I was no, like, no, no, I've, I first started I... playing. I didn't know these <laughs> players. I, like, I'd never met them before. Like, you're like a little kid, aren't you, at Christmas? Yeah, it was. But I was quite lucky. In 2008, I played against South Africa. We had a touring team. Middlesex played against South Africa um, at Uxbridge um, just before the test. I don't know if you were... Were you playing test cricket then, 2008, Swanee? Uh, yeah, I just started. The end of that year, I started. End of that year. So that was the middle of the, the, the English summer. Um, and, you know, after one of the, the day's plays... Uh, AB was doing his hair. He still had hair at the time. At the time, so he was he, <laughs> his he, real he, hair. before the horse's his, hair came along. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so he was do, doing his hair then. I sort of I spoke to him in Afrikaans actually, and he sort of was a bit like, oh, because there, there was before the days when you had your name on your back. I think um, I can't remember if we had a name on our backs then or whatever. But you know, obviously Milan would stand out as South African. Um, you know, and then I, I played it. We played against them. Had a bit of a chat to him. I got sixty in that game, and then about two weeks later. Um, we played that T20 quarterfinal at the Oval and I got 100 um, yeah. in that. And um, I turned my phone on and I had a message from AB. Um, he messaged O.A. Shah and got my number off O.A. Shah and to message me and say, hey, bud, awesome work. That was a hell of a knock. Um, in so, in know, English that's... or in Afrikaans? <laughs> in Afrikaans. In, in, in Afrikaans. Yes, so that's that was... <laughs> <laughs> So that was... That, that, so that's that's the lick of the you... are, man. <laughs> <laughs> but that just shows you the the what, what the guys are like. You know, they're 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 absolute superstars and they're heroes, but they're so down to earth and they're so yeah. appreciative of of if, if someone does well. And you know, since then, I've I've actually been quite lucky. I've actually like driven past AB running at some point, like wherever I've been, and then you'd send him a message and and he'd reply straight away. And yeah. uh, funny enough, we actually have the same guys that manage each. We manage us both now. So I was actually on the plane over coming to here we were both on the same domestic flight so it's amazing how you sort of cross paths after that which is um, yeah. great considering you you know you, you sort of looked up to these guys when you were kids you like you basically get to become tight with your boyhood heroes yeah which is well I wouldn't sound tight 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 with AB yeah I'd love to be tight with AB yeah but you know he played for he played for Middlesex and um, and what have you so you know I, I felt like I built a good relationship with a guy as you said that I idolized which is you know it's just like you can just message AB whenever I want. Like, 
you know, but imagine yeah. telling your t- 16 year old self that, you know what, you can just message AV whenever you want. And No, I just had to ask you because, uh, you know, but, uh, well, I found so interesting when you're talking about, you know, meeting your heroes and seeing that they're so down to earth. Can I just say, David, as a fan, how cool it was to see you, you know, the number one T20 batsman right now, getting your IPL debut cap from, you know, by far one of the most iconic T20 batsmen ever. Chris Gale. What, what was that moment like? I always want to know what happens when someone gives you your cap. What do they say? And you know, it's Chris Gale is the universe boss. I'm pretty sure he has something, you know, very Chris Gale like to say. Yeah, look, it's it's always a proud moment when you make a debut for any team. Um, you know, to play in the IPL has been a dream of mine. So to be able to get that cap, um, disappointing that the tournament sort of has been postponed just as I got that cap. I'd have liked to hopefully get one or two more games to show what I can do. Um, but you're right, to get your cap is a special moment. Usually you get it from, um, you know, wherever you play, it's either someone who's probably done more than you or someone that you really respect or a really good mate of yours that, that hands your cap over. Um, you know, so to receive my cap from Chris Gale, who, as I said, has arguably been the best T20 player in the world, um, you know, for a number of years, he's transformed this game. And basically the way he's he's he sort of played, it's it's he, he as you said, he's the most iconic player. To be totally honest, I can't actually remember what he said. It was a bit of a blur. I, uh, he has to speak really clearly sometimes for me to understand him um, <laughs> or Chris. But uh, you know, it was it was just sort of a, along the lines of you know, it's a it's a good moment for you. Um, you know, good luck. Show us what you can do and and, and have a good game, pretty much. Um, but what a character that guy is. You know, he's great to have around the team. He's he's a lovely bloke. As I said, he's he's open. He's 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 willing to share his knowledge. He's willing to share a, a laugh with you. Um, you know, so you can see why he's been so successful over the years you know you got someone like KL Rahul you got someone like Chris Gale you got someone like Anil Kumble so what were the sort of conversations that you were having as you said this was your first IPL experience yeah it was uh it was it was was actually um because of COVID and because of the training situation and stuff like that it was it was quite hard so if you weren't part of the sort of uh initial 12 um that sort of 12 was sort of trained sort of separately so you didn't really get to to mix too much with Kale um, at sort of training days. You could see him in the hotel and have sort of a breakfast and sit across him and, and, and what have you. Um, you know, and obviously sad to see that he had that that sort of operation to for him to miss. You know, he was having a great IPL. Um, Anil on the other end is is just such a nice guy. He's so quiet. And, um, you know, when he does speak to you, he, he actually speaks sense. Not like a lot of guys like Swanee who just carry on for the sake of it and they just talk just to, just to get their word count up. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's um, you know, it, it and I, I touched on this earlier. That's that's the beauty of of franchise cricket is that you get to mix with different people from different cultures that are different, have different personalities. That you um, have to learn pretty quickly how to work with those people. Um, you know, with Chris, you can sort of speak anything. With with Kale, you're still sort of as you know, he's captain. He's a really down to earth guy. Really really uh, welcoming as well. Um, Anil is exactly the same, but a lot quieter than than, than the other two. So, um, you know, it, it's trying to work out how you sort of mix with these guys and how you interact with them to, to sort of um, get to know them uh, along the journey. I mean, that's a lot of people will be shocked to hear that, that because of COVID, and it's good to hear that, that it was so well played that you couldn't all just mix and it wasn't just everyone training at the same time in and out. So there were such strict protocols within the bubble. Yeah, they were. You know, the bubble was um, was really strict, especially with um, with the training and what have you. You know, we we had a two hour slot, and you had to be in and out with the two. If you weren't allowed to be over for one minute, um, you know, so everything was done. You know, extremely well to make sure we were we were extremely well protected. And then it it sort of, as you said, when because of COVID as well, you had a squad of twenty six players, um, and you're not fitting twenty six players through in, in a two hour slot. So it became quite <laughs> tough for the co- for the coaches to juggle um sort of who is who is um in and around. So, you know, as I said, they, when you were part of that initial eleven, twelve and maybe fourteen man squad that they were, you know, thinking about playing in the next game, they were sort of given the priority to to train and to get themselves prepared. Um, you know, which when you're sort of not part of that it does become quite hard when you're in a bubble. Um, you know, from my own experience, I once I finished this quarantine now, I'd have been in a bubble for six months and two days, with and I've been out for three weeks in between, and I've only played nineteen games of cricket. Um, so 
it's, it's, it's amazing if you think about the time that you're actually away just to play 19 games of cricket. Um, you know, it's extremely tough. So, you know, for me, the training was the bit that kept me going to be able to get out of the hotel and hit cricket ball. So when you, you, you couldn't do that as often as you want, that's when the bubble started becoming tough. And when you were sort of yeah. outside of the bubble, uh, that's when it sort of became, well, not outside of the bubble, when you were actually at training, um, you could actually have fun with, with your teammates and you could, you know, learn and you can practice and you can work with different coaches because that's what the the IPL and franchise cricket's about. It's not just about playing games and, and, and scoring runs and earning money. It's about actually learning and developing as a player. So how do you do it? Because both, uh, Swanee, uh, you're also going through the same thing at the moment where you've just practically been in a bumble because of your commentary assignments. You mentioned the training aspect of it, but David, the mental aspect of it. I mean, there are enough pressures with this game as it is, especially international cricket. The isolation aspect that all international athletes are facing right now is not something that you're used to. So how do you do it? How do you motivate yourself to get out on the field? Yeah, it's uh, look, I think the if you're playing, that helps. Um, that helps a hell of a lot because you've always got something to look forward to. Uh, when you're not playing, I think that's probably the hardest bit. You know, I know there's been a couple of guys with England that have travelled along with the test and never haven't played a game and what have you like that. I think that's extremely tough. Um, you know, from a mental side of view, you know, it's not only the fact that you're sat in a bubble, but you've got families or wives and kids that are sat at home. You know, I've not seen my wife for, as I said, it's three weeks and six months that I've seen her. Um, and she has you know, her issues that she goes through and then suddenly you're having to deal with being in the bubble, her being alone at home or your kids are ill or whatever the situation may be. Not, I haven't got kids, but that's just an, as, as an example. Um, you've got no release from the bubble of, of being able to get out and go for a coffee or meet anyone different. So you can't go in like like back in the day before COVID, you could go to the, the, the opposition's hotel and have a beer with Swanee if you wanted um, and just sort of, you know, the, the guys that you're closer with. So you're, you're ended up basically sat in your room or at training, or at a, get a ground for six months of the time, um, you know, which becomes time. There's only so many times you can play Call of Duty. There's only so many times you can uh -huh. uh, you can watch Netflix. You know, you you, you sort of yeah, it, it just becomes sort of a monotonous day after day sort of thing. And I know people uh, will sit at home and go, well, you know, you're doing what you love and you're getting paid to do what you what you do, but you know, it it is mental. It is mentally taxing. It is you know the trying to switch off is impossible. There's always something, as Swanee said, there's always a meeting. There's always a, uh, let's catch up for this. There's always, lads, let's get together for this. There's never sort of a way, a bit where you've got a full day to be away from what you're doing and just to get sort of hold of what your stuff. So it's, yeah, it's 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 tougher than what it sounds. Um, you know, I think a lot of people will sort of jump at the idea to be, oh, we'll be away for six months and you're staying in really nice hotels and being looked after really nicely and you're playing the sport. But it's, it's you know, the the away from the sport point of view, it does become really, really tough. Um, you know, I know I, I had a bad, bad sort of period in Chennai. Um, recently, I think we only had four or five days in Chennai. But, you know, we had, we had a flight and you're dressing up in all the stuff and you're sort of questioning, why, why am I doing this? Like, why am I sort of... Um, putting myself through this you know my you know your, my wife's at home and she's she's alone and she's might be having a couple of bad days and that sort of rubs off on you and suddenly you start you know getting really sort of caught up in a bubble um as such um you know but then as soon as you get over that little period then you suddenly feel fine again for the next week to 10 days and, and you have a bit bit more energy and, and and stuff like that um so it's not as easy as people think do you think that the lack of cricket you've had over, you know, 19 games in six months is just a, almost a joke when you think about it? Do you think that will make you hungrier um, or more appreciative of every time you bat from now on? Because I know in England, like, especially when you play county cricket, you can get very blasé about batting every day. You just think, well, it's part and parcel. But do you think you'll be hungrier this year because of it? Yeah, I hope so. Um, I'd be worried if I'm not. I might as well be retiring if I'm not 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 getting hungry for it. But Trust but me, um, don't retire. <laughs> no, no, I'll be clinging on. I'll be like Darren Stevens. Someone's gonna have to throw me out of it. <laughs> 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 um, but no, like it's um, yeah. Look, I I, I want to play cricket um, as badly, but then there's you know there's the the balance of you know, the, the mental fatigue that you're getting from the bubble is probably the same as what you'd be playing for five or six months either way. Maybe not to that extreme, but it'd be probably be, you know, if you're in a bubble for six months, it'd probably be like you've just played cricket for two months and you've actually concentrated constantly in the pressures and the, you know, you see more stuff. So it um it, it, it makes it hard. But um look, yeah, 
I, I love playing cricket. I want to score as many runs as I possibly can every time I get an opportunity. Um, so um, I'd, I would say I'd be hungrier to play. Um, it's just trying to find that balance of actually being able to get out of the bubble and be able to sort of um, have sort of sort of a normal life to some extent um, and play cricket because this I don't think this bubble is sustainable um, to, to keep these the, the players in con- continuous bubbles like this sustainable. And it's tough. It's tough to be away from family, as you mentioned. I mean, Swanee, you're also going to the same thing. You've been away from your missus. Uh, i got to ask you something, though. What does uh, your missus think about the Milky Way boss? Where did that come from? <laughs> the Milky Way boss. That was Mark Wood. Well, being explain that to he us. Is. He's, he's, uh, he, he's, the, he's a, a funny man, Mark Wood. Uh, one of the good ones in, 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 in cricket. Um, I, I think it was in South Africa we, you know, I... I think I'd just broken Chris Gale's record or something like that about the quickest to 10.50s in international cricket, um, something along those lines. And he said, jokingly, he said, well, we've he's the universe boss and we've got the Milky Way boss. So that was the first time. I don't know why he's gone Milky Way boss, but he's... Uh, he, he's, he's, he, he's, he just he's, realised the Milky Way is smaller than the universe. <laughs> <laughs> I know, he's... He's a he's a funny man. He's not not sometimes not the the sharpest tool in the shed, but um, yeah, I'll take it as a compliment from him either way. Yeah, you should have gone multiverse boss. That'd have been a bit better. How did you how did your wife react to that? That, that you're now sort of uh, almost like a Marvel character, like a guardian of the galaxy. <laughs> My wife honestly does couldn't care less. <laughs> she she does not she she doesn't really enjoy cricket. Whenever I tell her about the cricket, she goes, "Did you get more than naught or not?" And I'll be like, "Yeah, I got more." And she goes, "That's a good day then." And then that's that's yeah. the sort of conversation over, which is quite Wait, good. Damn it, you're don't talk one. about cricket a lot. Yeah, I know, but she's cause she, so she's she's from Scotland. She's not really been uh, grew, grew up with cricket and what have you. She, I think she's more she's a football probably hooligan. Played rugby, I think, yeah. No, no, she's a football hooligan. So she would be what the one in the back <laughs> in, in the back throwing beers and stuff like that and screaming abuse at the TV. So she's one of those ones. Um, so luckily, she doesn't know much about cricket. Otherwise, it could be chaos if she comes to the games and sits in the boxes if she knew anything about it. But no, it's. Um, I think that's the good thing is that that I actually have the balance of. Of, of a wife that's not really too interested in cricket, that I don't have to be talking about cricket 24-7, um, that doesn't really get involved um, in what I do. She'll ask the odd question of, how did you go today? Like, actually, like to the, like the my IPL debut, actually, she messaged saying, how did, how did today go? And I went, yeah, right, I, I, I probably missed out on a few here or there. And she went, well, I watched and I thought you were rubbish. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, there you go. You know nothing about it. If you think I'm rubbish, then I think everyone must think I'm rubbish. <laughs> I, I think I'm falling for your wife here. Yeah? This is brilliant. <laughs> she's, a, she's, a, she's a blunt football hooligan, basically. Oh, yeah. Don't, don't, don't quote her on that. She's going to kill me if that quote comes out, that quote. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I used to get a very similar thing that... From my my wife didn't know cricket at all. So the first time she ever watched me play, um, she came to Nottingham and I put her in the wags box and she got drunk with all the other wags. And then uh, I got five wickets and I got 60 yards. Best game of my life. And it was on telly, got man of the match, <laughs> proud as punch. And I said to her afterwards, how did you think I got on? Did you enjoy that? And she said, I didn't know which one of the spin bowlers you were. The other spin <laughs> bowler was Samit Patel. <laughs> so, similar body shape to be fair yeah exactly I mean now maybe but at the time I was live I mean I looked like <laughs> I was devastated I mean he's a foot shorter than me and in, of Indian descent but you know I'll go with it I, I, I decided to marry her on the spot actually because I thought there will never be I will never get shouted at for getting caught cover anymore it, it's funny it's funny how life finds a way to uh, level you out even if you're the number one t20 batsman in the world but you know what let's let's move on to our dare to declare segment this is brought to you by uh Bentway. let's talk about the hot topic because you know, swan we got the number one man here you know i mean it, it's a spot he like to keep for a while i'm sure he's going to be raining in that spot yeah you of course always funny but uh, I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well, uh, Graham. Who do you think, uh, David, right now uh, is probably the best batsman in this format? Um, you know, I, I still, honestly, and I, I just watching the guy go about it as a 37-year-old, A.B. de Villiers in, in T20 cricket uh, for a bloke who sort of doesn't play, doesn't play for four months and then suddenly plays again. I think the way that he can go, the way that the fact that he can sort of 
play any role. He can bat at five. He can bat at three. Um, he can finish. He can set up an innings. I, I you know, I, I, I think he's by far, you know, the the best T Twenty player um, in in domestic cricket. And I know he doesn't play international cricket anymore. Go, going around, you know, there's I don't think there's many better than him um, at the moment. I reckon that you can't argue with stats. So, Darren Milan for me. Um, <laughs> i tell you what I do like about the IPL, though. One thing that I, I think is one of the reasons it is one, if not the best T20 tournament in the world, is that every team has absolute match winners, like ball ter- game turners. Like Darren said, then, a 20 from 10 balls at the right time can be more important than a 50 or 40. And the, the IPL games are never over. The chasing team is never out of it. If they've got someone like Pollard or Andre Russell or AB, Virat Kohli, Darren Milan, Josh Butler, Ben Stokes, every team has got one or two unbelievable strikers to the ball. I've not even mentioned a single Australian there on purpose. <laughs> um, but, you know what I mean? I think it, it, it is such a good tournament and that's why it's so brilliant to watch. I mean, those last couple of games, and also the, the grounds that are played on, People don't realise, back in England especially, how ridiculously hard it is to bowl at some of these grounds. Like the Coltler in Delhi, if you're a spin bowler or a medium pacer or, in fact, even Jasper Bumrah, you're going for more than 50 off your four overs on a good batting wicket. It was a beach last year that turned square and no one could get a run. And this year, what did Karen Pollard got 80 off about 20 balls to win the game? I mean, that is just bonkers. So I, I, I don't think you can say there's just one player who's the best in the world. Every team has potentially on the night the best player in the world playing in their team. That's why it's so good. Let me flip it up for you, both of you then. Let's put it this way. What, if we're just talking about purely about batsmen, now what skill, I guess, is more important? Do you want a top order batsman who sets the tone and perhaps goes you know, to anchor the innings? Or do you want someone at the end who wins you the game in 10 deliveries or one over or of two deliveries? What what would you rather have what skill do you think is more valued from that perspective yeah. but I, I think yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're yeah. symbiotic they need one needs the other I don't think you can just have a team of merry-go hackers like KKR tried it a couple of times and tried to be absolute like, hackers from the top and it didn't work but when you've got one or two people who and let's face it anchoring these days is still scoring at 130 140 it's not the old fashioned 100 off 160 balls so no. yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you totally. And if you look at the Mumbai Indians, they've probably been the most successful team in the IPL for a, for a number of number of years. And you've got Rohit Sharma who plays his way, and if he gets in, he's still going to score really quickly. But he consistently scores runs. Quinton de Kock yeah. plays really quickly, but scores runs. Um, Sky, I think Sky is an unbelievable player. And you have these guys, um, Kishan, I think it is in, in the top four. That that play their way are aggressive and able to score runs consistently, and then suddenly you've got Pollard, Pandya, Pandya that can come in and absolutely change a game. That's you know that's a great balance of a team. Um, if you look at an, an, an IPL team, um, you know so you have the mix of guys that when they get in they'll still 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 score a hundred off fifty odd balls. Um, plus you have guys that can get you thirty off ten balls if needed. Uh, we've spoken so much about pressure. Let's uh, increase the pressure a little bit. Uh, David, are you up for some quick fire predictions? Oh my gosh. Okay, let's go. Okay, no, it, it's easy. It's easy. They're just whatever. First thing that comes to mind. Okay. So uh, the IPL is suspended. So we're assuming that it's going to come back, be back wearing the Punjab jersey. So uh, your IPL winner and your runner up. Gosh, the winner. I'd love to say Punjab Kings, but we've got a, a big hill to climb to get there. Um, I, 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 I like the way Delhi have been playing. I really like the way they've, you know, things have been going their way. They've got a good balanced team. Um, you know, I don't think you can ever write off the Mumbai Indians. So I'd probably say that those two, um, the way those two are going. I, I, Chennai Super Kings have been brilliant, but it depends where you're going to move to. If you move to the UAE, it might be slightly different with the different grounds and stuff there. So it'd be interesting to see. Rajasthan. <laughs> it's funny you had to get that in there. David, who is the young player in this Punjab team who's going to take the world by storm? Uh, I, I really like the look of Bishnoi, the, the leg spinner. Um, I think he's got something about him. He's um, bowls a really good pace, uh, a lot quicker than 
most leggies um, and some good, some good variations. And he's still really, really young. So um, I think he's got a, a good journey ahead of him if he can, continues on that track. So KL should be okay. I'm guessing he would be in contention by the time it resumes. Who would be your guest for the orange cap? Because I know he's in contention and the purple cap, those wickets. Uh, I th- I, well, look, I, I hope KL gets the orange cap, which means that we'll potentially win some more games. Um, you know, if, if when he scores runs, we, we do well. Um, you know, so who, who's the current uh, orange cap at the moment? Darwin. Shikhar Darwin. Well, he's been playing fantastically well as well. If he keeps on that route, I don't think anyone's going to catch him. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd I'd probably say one of those two will could could get that. Um, I think the other guys have got a long way to go to catch those two with the amount of runs that they've they've scored. Um, from a bowling point of view, I know is it is it Harshal who's got it uh, from uh, RCB. Um, but I think you know I I, I think Jasper Boomer is such a such a serious bowler. I can see him um, sort of catching him at some point. And if you were playing you know fantasy cricket if you were taking uh, you know apart from one of the fantasy teams David who would be the first name on your team sheet Whew. uh gosh I'd, I'd have to say like a Ben Stokes or someone like that someone that can bat and bowl um yeah I'd say someone like that him or Pollard or a Butler someone like that who can do two two um aspects or disciplines Swanee what do you think I'd go for mine would be Dawid Milan <laughs> but get me in the top three, please, Swanee. Yeah, no P- problem. Pick me in the That's top exactly three. Exactly where you're at. No, I, 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 if I was one thing I thought about doing for this because there's all the fancy cricket for this IPL was to pick all the all the English guys. And if you get all the English guys out and you see their performances, you do really well. The English boys really perform. Sam Curran. No one's spoken about Sam Curran. He's having a hell of a tournament, you know. Mm. Little Northampton Sam. Mm. It was either last year's one or the year before. I can't remember which one it was. Um, but watching him bat in the nets, how different and how much more power he had and stronger base, yeah. and how clear he was on knowing his game with the ball and stuff like that. It's it, you know, and from someone who sort of is is pretty much on the outside, and you sort of like to observe and you like to watch guys to just to watch how quickly he would learnt and improved was you know phenomenal for a young guy yeah. like him. Um, and the, the you know he can just keep growing and growing and growing. It's, it's not just the IPL, but of course, all of us are looking forward to the T20 World Cup. Uh, we're thinking about venues now. So if, if it goes according to plan and it's uh, you know still in India, let's just take it from that perspective, uh, David. But winner and runner-up, come on, let's have some fun with this. <laughs> oh, gosh, you're, put, you're putting me on the spot. Well, well I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say I'm gonna say England to win it. Whether I'm in that World Cup squad or not, I would like England to win that World Cup. Um, um, you know, from a, a running a runner up point of view, you know what? Like, look, India in their their home conditions will be extremely tough to beat. It just shows that most of the World Cups that are in the host country they they win. I know T Twenty slightly different, um, but I, I I actually think the West Indies are, are are a team to watch out for when they have all their team. They, they're going to have all their players available. Um, you know, you have a batting lineup of Lewis Simmons, Gale, Puran. Hetmeyer, Pollard, uh, Russell, Bravo, um, Holder, like Narine, like you've got unbelievable players suddenly available. Um, so I think they could be a, a a team that could challenge in that World Cup. And to to be fair, I think all, all the teams are actually really good, considering we're playing in India. You know, Pakistan are obviously a fantastic team in in subcontinent conditions and in in, in general. Um, you know, so I'm I the team that come. Second behind England, if I had to say England were to win, I don't actually know because there's so many, but I, I wouldn't write India off in their own country. What do you think of that, Swanee? Well, England will obviously win. Um, and then who cares who comes second, to be honest? First, you know, second place is a losing place. Uh, no, I I think what will be amazing, actually, that, that five matches that England and India played in Ahmedabad, I think was just a dress rehearsal for what could be the well, 2020 final. I think if it goes ahead in India, that's where the final will be played, and it will be England India. I think if it's in the UAE, I think that pushes it more towards England. If I'm honest, but you know, I'm I'm not at all um, fair and and dispassionate. I am very biased, so England. <laughs> I'm not at all surprised by any of the answers that we've gotten. But let's switch it up. Let's try and make it neutral because you mentioned the final. So, gentlemen, World Test Championship final. Now, who's winning that? And Ooh. who's your MVP in the World Series? Who's your player of the match? Let's have some fun with this. 
I've just, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but I just saw that uh, Trent Bolt might not be playing or he might be playing that. What? I think he's gone home, so he might, whether he's missing the England ones or he's missing that one, I don't know what he's he oh, no, no, missing. No. One so, the... so they've they've gone home for like four or five days and then they're flying straight to Southampton. Okay, so he's not going to miss it, yeah. So he's yeah. not going to miss any of it, yeah. So I, I, I think if, if New Zealand have their full attack and India, I think their attacks are pretty much matched. Um personally from facing both of those attacks i think they're both unbelievable attacks they've both ruined my careers um in my test could my test career so they're, they're they're very very good um i think it will come down to the batting and and who scores the most runs and i'm guessing it will probably be between whoever scores the most runs between virat and kane i think will will probably be the the ones that that win so i i don't really know i'm, I'm gonna sit on the fence with that one swanee can give a prediction for that if it swings, then New Zealand have the edge. If it spins, India will win. Ooh, that's, a, that's a big guys. shout. You've got no, 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 no. I'll tell you, they do, they do swing it, but they haven't got a left armer who swings it. And everybody knows if the ball's swinging, you've got a left armer. Front pads get blown off all over the place. <laughs> I think Jasper Broom and Bowles <laughs> blows your front pad yeah, off. But he's not, yeah, but it's... it's <laughs> Jasper's just got married. He'll be just focusing <laughs> somewhere else. <laughs> no, no, I think... I tell you what, I think it's going to be an amazing game. And what I can tell you, especially if you're listening in India, is that the weather over here in England is pretty good. There's been a lot of big scores scored so far in the Counting Championship up until this week. And then all of a sudden, the ball started swinging around the corners, around corners again. And there are a lot of low scores this week. So, read what you will into that. All right. So, okay, Swanee, we, we'll take that as a prediction. Uh, David, I can't thank you enough for, uh, for joining us on this. And especially really opening about you know, how, how tough life is right now when you're in quarantine. Because it, it is, frankly, for a professional athlete who gets, doesn't get an opportunity to step up to the field. The fact that you have that ranking behind you as well, it's just awesome that you could share those sort of thoughts with us. So, uh, you know, thanks so much uh, for doing that. And I'm pretty sure, Swani, that uh, you did live up to expectations, right? Like, this was a great, insightful chat, David. Thank you for that. I knew, I told you he would be before, and when we got on, I said, David, 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 whoever you want to call him will be amazing. And, and yeah, thank you for coming on because you've been amazing and what you've done in international cricket has been nothing short of stellar. And thank you again for your debut, for not for making me look like a hero in the commentary <laughs> box rather than a villain. I'll I got you another that. couple of years there, didn't I? Well, no, I got sacked six months later, but thank <laughs> you anyway. No, thanks for having me, guys. I've enjoyed it.